Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Before we start today's program, program, it's not a program. Before we get into this podcast episode, uh, I just want to thank everyone on Patreon. A couple of you guys joined this week and super encouraging. Like I said in a couple of podcasts uh, earlier, I would love to do this uh, full time. I would love to start doing in-person podcast episodes with thinkers at their uh, universities, at their homes, out in the field, uh, doing biology stuff, wherever. I would love that. So the more people that join and support on Patreon, uh, the better podcasts I can start delivering to you guys. I appreciate all the support so far. If you've benefited from this podcast, please consider joining Patreon, uh, my Patreon, becoming a patron. You can find the link in the description. Another way to support is to uh, subscribe at YouTube and turn on the notification bells so you can see all the new episodes. And then above and beyond, I love when you guys do this. I really, really appreciate it. If you go to Apple Podcasts, leave me a five-star review and a comment. That would be huge. Helps with algorithms and all that crazy stuff. Uh, today's episode is super fun. I have a returning guest with me, Dr. Gray Sutanto, Nathaniel Gray Sutanto, some of you will see. Uh, we are going to be talking about simplicity and his response to uh, another past guest, uh, Dr. Oliver Crisp, and his uh conception of, of simplicity. So Gray's going to be talking about a maximal view of simplicity, and we're going to talk just real briefly about what the heck simplicity is, what it means to say God is simple. But without further ado, let's just jump right in. Gray, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast, man. Parker, it's great to be here. I listen to your podcast, and I've always enjoyed the tone, and you've exemplified a good way of interviewing people. So it's really great to be back. Dude, thank you. And and so uh, if you're watching on YouTube, the, the video might be a little glitchy, but uh, Gray's in Bali right now. So uh, by the modern uh, miracle of the internet, we're good, we're talking to each other. It's like 10, 13 here. I just got done with jujitsu. So it's like, what, what, what is it? Nine in the morning right now where you're at? It's exactly 11 o'clock right now. So it's an hour difference between here and Jakarta. But yeah, it's amazing. Technology could really connect us. And I'm here mostly just waiting out our visa worries, um, mm -hmm. but also um, here translating Bobbing's Christian scholarship or Christelijk Wetenschap for Crossway. So slowly going through that and there's no better place to do work like this when it's just you and your laptop in a context like yeah. Bali, so. Yeah, well, I've seen some of the updates. <clears throat> I think the other day you were saying, maybe it was today, something about how this one's getting you as excited or more excited than Christian worldview. Yeah, I think it's getting me a little bit more excited than Christian worldview just because um, he seems to be laying his cards out more on the table. He's, he's showing his indebtedness to, in this indebtedness to Augustine a bit more. Mm -hmm. He is critiquing other particular Christian attempts at constructing a Christian scholarship or a Christian science. So I think you're really going to see him laying out his cards on the table a bit more in this one. That's awesome. Uh, great. I mean, you're, you're, I think you just started that project. Any idea when that's due or when that's going to come out? Yeah, it's actually due end of August. So um, I'm translating about 40 pages. James is translating. James Eglinton, he's translating about 40 pages and Corey another 40 pages. So we hope to be able to get this done, probably Lord willing, at the beginning of August, and then we can edit it and we send it around to one another, edit one at a time, and then we'll send it out to Crossway late August. Oh, awesome. So you guys are checking each other's work on, on those 40 yeah. pages each? Sweet. That's okay. right. Yeah. And uh, for, for those who don't know, um, Gray's is part of uh, this new Bavink uh, revolution, uh, revolution, uh, reformation, uh, and in Bavink studies, and I have uh, his one of his books here, Christian Worldview. Uh, it's it's Herman Bavink's book, but it's translated by Gray and James Eglinton and Corey Brock, all of whom have been guests on the podcast. I highly recommend you grab this book. It looks real small. Um, it is really small, but it's powerful. And we're going to talk just at the end of this podcast a little bit about what Bavink has to say about simplicity. Uh, I love this book and uh, I'll be reading it more and more and more and more. So, dude, thanks so much for all your work and translating that. And then this next one and who knows all of them. I hope you guys do all of all of the Bavink works. Yeah, if time permits, you know, and thanks so much for uh, talking about that book as well. And also correcting that it's not a revolution, but a reformation. That's, That's right. the right way to go about it. That's right. That's right. Well, OK, great. So uh, jumping in on simplicity. Just real quick for the listeners who who don't know or are unfamiliar with the idea that God is simple. Can you lay that out for us? What does it mean to say that God is simple? Yeah, so 
I mean, there's multiple models of divine simplicity, but in the response that I had written out in uh, my contribution to Philosophia Christi, it's a symposium, the response to Oliver Cripps analyzing doctrine, I defend the maximal account of divine simplicity. And basically mm -hmm. what that account says is that God is not composed of parts, but rather God's attributes are all identical to his own essence. And that whatever distinctions we make about God, they're only distinctions of reason, but not distinctions within the thing himself. Mm -hmm. So uh, God is essentially identical with his love. God is essentially identical with his wisdom and so on. And those attributes are really just describing the one divine substance. So roughly that's what I would say is the model of divine simplicity I'm working with. Okay. And uh, you can't really see in the background here, but it's a prism with white light coming in and uh, a rainbow coming out. And oftentimes uh, theologians have used that to, to use as an analog to simplicity that just as white light is refracted out into different colors through a prism. So God's uh, nature or essence is refracted in the prism of creation. And so we can see that his love and justice and mercy, but really when it comes to God, it's all the same. God is his essence and his essence is him. Is that, is that right? Right. Yeah. And normally um, the Protestant scholastic distinctions here also pertain to divine simplicity, that there is no distinctions in God between act and potency, yeah. between essence and existence, uh, between um, all of his attributes, in other words. So they've tried to use these um, Aristotelian terms to deny distinctions of God and also genus and species and so on. So we can get into those as well, but yeah. uh, there's a lot here being involved. And basically the purpose of divine simplicity, as we're going to talk about, uh, Futius mentions this, is to highlight God's maximal perfection. Mm -hmm. That divine simplicity is not just about denying composition within God, but it's also to highlight that God is absolutely perfect and hence that God is absolutely distinct from his creatures. What is it that makes God distinct? It's that he is actually simple and not composite like his creatures are. Yeah. Yeah, that's really helpful. So um, I was going to ask you about this, but you, you uh, anticipated that. Uh, in theology, for folks at home, these are, these words are crazy, but there's a distinction between apophatic uh, theology and cataphatic, and apophatic is like the way of negation. That'd be saying uh, God is not limited. God, So God is limitless. God is, um, you know, not composed of parts. And so just gray in, in your mind, uh, I think you probably alluded to this, and I think you talk about, I, I know you talk about it in the paper, but is the doctrine of simplicity a, a apophatic or a cataphatic doctrine for you? Yeah, great question. Um, I mean, again, different theologians would say things a little bit differently. And to me, I think mostly it's an apophatic doctrine. That okay. is about denial of composition. It's about denial of any kind of creaturely qualities as it pertains to God. Uh, but as we're doing this apophatic thing, as we're denying things about God, it's so that we're highlighting how different God is from us and yeah. how unique God is. You know, the, the denial of the distinction, for example, between genus and species means that God is not within the category, within the same category of creatures, right? God is not in a category, but God is his own category. And so um, it's an apophatic doctrine, but at the same time, it, it's meant to highlight something about the perfections of God. Yeah. And that's important. Uh, people might be wondering, like, why is that important? But God's not just an instantiation of a species of God, like this Nate, there's like this abstract nature of God and God so happens to be one, but maybe there could be another one. Maybe there could be more. Maybe there could be, no, like there's with humans, it's like that. I'm an instantiation of, instantiation of a man and, and Gray's an instantiation of a man, but God is not that kind of thing. There is no distinction to be made between, uh, yeah, genus and categories and differentia and stuff like that. Right. That's exactly right. And, you know, that's exactly in the context in which God disclosed his name to Moses. Mm. It was at the context of, you know, Moses asking God, you know, what gives you the authority to send me a mere mortal to someone who is as powerful as Pharaoh? Yeah. Like, how am I supposed to rescue your people from this really powerful ruler like Pharaoh? What gives you the right? What gives you the authority? And this is the context in which God disclosed his name, that he is, I am who I am. And I think what he's trying to disclose there is that he is not in the same category of lordship as Pharaoh is. Pharaoh is one lord among many lords. His lordship, his power is a contingent and relative power. He is powerful precisely because he's ruled other nations, so it's relative to other nations. He's powerful because he had actualized the potentiality of power within him. It's a creaturely kind of power. 
but God's lordship is of an entirely different kind whatsoever. He, it's, he's not in the same genus as Pharaoh is, but rather his power is a independent power. His power is a necessary power. His power is not something that he needed to actualize, but rather he is the self-existent power. And so when he says that I am what I am, or I am who I am, he's trying to say, I am power because I am power. I am mm. powerful because I am powerful. It's not because of anything else outside of me that made me powerful or that made me Lord, but I am God, the self-existent one who's self-sufficient. So I think that's exactly right what you were just articulating there. Dude, I love that. That's that's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. I have it tattooed on my arm here. Uh, I have, I think, therefore, Ehye, and, and uh, in Exodus 3.14, it's Ehye, Ser, Ehye, I think I am that I am. And um, I got into this because of because of Van Til. This is kind of a, a Van Tilian gloss. It's like the transcendental argument. But um, I got into this, and I saw there was this kind of debate between modern scholars and, and uh, the Reformed scholastics and the, the ancient folks. And all the fathers and the scholastics were saying, this is God talking about his aseity. This is God talking about um, his essence. And all the modern scholars were saying, well, no, this is more about God saying he'll be with his people. And then Gerhardus Voss comes along and he's like, well, they're both missing part of it. The reason that God can tell Moses and promise that he'll be with him is because of his nature, because he is self-existent, because he's ase. What could possibly move him? He doesn't depend on anything. What could ever make him stray from his word? And his promise to be with him, um, but I love I love the take that you were the lordship take. I, I haven't really before reading your article, I hadn't really seen the lordship take as much, and I think that one is is equally valid too. I think that's awesome. I got to ponder on that one a lot more. Yeah, and I think you know John Webster makes exactly the same kind of points. Mm. It is precisely because God is self existent and self sufficient that his being with his people is entirely. A gift of grace that it yeah. is not something that we had done that compelled him to move towards us but rather it is utterly out of his own self donation which is also a very kind of scholastic term his own self donation yeah that he would give himself to his people and this so unconditionally mm -hmm. yeah so i think Voss is exactly right in highlighting that um yeah that's awesome. Well, okay, so um, your paper is uh, it's coming out in uh, Philosophia Christi, and it's on <clears throat> Oliver Crisp's Analyzing Doctrine, and it's on his, uh, he, he's been on the show, so those listening, go back and, and find that episode. I can't remember which one it was, before the hundreds. Uh, but Crisp, call, Crisp calls his model the uh, parsimonious model, and um, you respond to that, and you 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 talk about how I say votius. I'm not as uh, cultured as you, uh, so I don't remember how you pronounce it. But uh, you talk about how vo votius uh, anticipated Chris's model, and I thought uh, I'll, I'll I want you to lay that out if you, if you got it on the top of your mind. But first, maybe I'll just read real quick uh, Chris's Chris uh, own parsing of his parsimonious model. He says one. God is a concrete entity, that is, he is not an abstract object, like a number or proposition. He is a concrete thing, like a human being. Two, God is an immaterial person, that is, he is not merely a metaphysical aggregate or artifact, like a chair or table. He is an agent, a living being, but not a material agent. Three, God is a necessary being, that is, he exists in all possible worlds. Four, God is metaphysically simple, that is, he is not composed by more fundamental elements, as is the case with material things, e.g. the fundamental subatomic elements that compose objects like tables and chairs at particular times and places. Five, God is essentially metaphysically simple, that is, it is not the case that <clears throat> he just happens to be metaphysically simple i.e. accidentally or contingently, he cannot fail to be metaphysically simple. It is part of his nature to be metaphysically simple. And six, God has distinct attributes that he exemplifies. And so that's an interesting model uh, for divine simplicity. But uh, as you lay out in your article, it's, I don't know, actually, how would, how would you say? It's not quite right. It doesn't go far enough. It opens the gate to things that, that shouldn't be, uh, it's not robust enough. What, 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 yeah, what do you make of it? Yeah, thanks, Parker. I think the first thing I got to say is that I really respect <laughs> Dr. Oliver Crisp, right? I mean, Professor yeah. Oliver Crisp, really. Right, right. Um, we're using the, the UK terminology now. He's really uh, um, someone that I really look up to. And um, 
someone that I think inspires a lot of us, uh, younger folks here. And also, you know, he's such a model of clarity, of generosity, and of just hard work and being charitable to his interlocutors, yet at the same time being firm with where he uh, stands. So I really appreciated his work. And mm -hmm. so it was really quite a privilege to be able to respond to this in the symposium at EPS last year. Um, so my own comments have to be situated within that kind of context. I'm not here to tear anybody down, right. but rather, um, so when I'm discussing about his model, I'm, I'm just making a rather modest point that this parsimonious model was something that was anticipated by someone like Hisbertus Futius. Mm -hmm. And uh, Futius was basically laying out in this piece that was translated by Ryan Hurd um, that, that this model of divine simplicity that was proposed by some of his own interlocutors sounds a lot like Oliver Christ's model. Hmm. And basically what he was trying to say is that whatever we mean by divine simplicity, it is not that we mean that God is simply metaphysically simple right. in the sense that a soul is simple. He actually uses that particular example. Yeah. So a soul is simple. God is simple. We're not saying that God is simple like the, the soul is simple because the soul is not composed of parts in the sense that you can't distinguish physical parts in the soul. You can't distinguish the soul um, because the soul is an immaterial thing, right? Right, right? So the soul is not composite and God is not composite, but we mean more than that, Futius explicitly states. Mm -hmm. And so he is aware that there are some interlocutors who are saying that God is simple like the soul is simple. And he explicitly said, that's not what we mean by God being simple. What we mean by God being simple is that there's no distinction in him between act and potency. There's no distinction in him between genus and species. And it's not something that we can say about the soul because the soul does have a distinction between act and potency. We're not just talking about um, growth mm. of physical parts here or distinctions of physical parts like a chair. You know, this is something that, that Professor Cripps had, had mentioned as well. But rather we're talking about any kind of developmental life. So the soul can develop. The soul yeah. can develop from potency to actuality. The soul is you know sharing a genus with other souls mm -hmm. we're all human souls right but there's no distinction in god between genus and species so futis is actually really concerned to uh highlight the denial of these scholastic terms the denial of these aristotelian concepts with regard to god and so he's trying to say that any change in god would be a change from potency to actuality or actuality to potency. So he's saying that particular kind of simplicity is what we mean when we refer to God. It's it's a absolute kind of simplicity and not just a simple simple. That's what he said about the soul. It's not just a simply simple soul. Yeah. But rather it's an absolutely simple God, right? So Okay. Uh I don't I don't so I don't know if I'm saying that like uh Chris model is erroneous. I don't think that I'm I'm immediately saying that um, I think that perhaps that's an implication of what I say, but but primarily I'm trying to say whatever Chris model is, it was anticipated by a scholastic named like Futius. And a lot of the objections that he brings about have been also anticipated by someone like not only Futius, but also Turretin. Mm. And I also mentioned Bonaventure and also Bovink as well. Yeah. Okay. And so um, that that point would just show that maybe this isn't this, the parsimonious model isn't as as novel as one would think it is, and it's not only been anticipated; it's been it's been responded to um, already. Right. I, I yeah. think <clears throat> so. One thing that you mentioned in the article, which I dude, I appreciate this about you too that that you are so charitable, um, and it's it's really easy to be charitable to Oliver Crisp, like the dude's a legend. Like yes. Um, but but I do appreciate that uh, you you mentioned how in uh, in sometimes in reform circles, any little slip up even is like, dude, jump on them, let's get them. You know, sometimes it can be heresy hunter type stuff. And so I really appreciate that you didn't do that. Um, what what in your mind is the impetus behind uh, Dr. Crisp's parsimonious model? Because I know sometimes he'll he'll just kind of throw things out like, hey. Let's see if this works. Let's try and broaden things. Let's just see if we can. Uh, just from from your interaction with him and and uh, reading the the book, what what do you think the the impetus behind having a uh, less than maximal a, a parsimonious model of simplicity would be? Yeah. Before I get into that, Parker, I think what you mentioned there about you know the necessity of charity when it comes to things like this is really really important, especially because again in conservative reform circles we're very used to kind of cannibalizing one another. We eat our own. And um, 
instead of critiquing some of the broader movements that are out there that are more explicitly, you know, against our tradition, we would rather critique one another. And I think there's a real worry here that I have. I think that when we do that in the way that we've done that, you know, though sometimes parts of this is necessary, as we saw in the 2016 Trinitarian debate, some of this yeah. heat was necessary. But I do think what's happened in the last four or five years is that the reform community has capitulated to the world's cancel culture. Yeah. We've, we've kind of adopted it as our own modus operandi. Mm -hmm. And we've basically, we've echoed the way the world is doing these things, you know? So we call someone out, we have tons of blogs written about this person. And instead of doing the patient work of establishing your position, we use peer pressure and social media to really rally up and, and, and you know, drum up opposition against particular people. Yeah, And I think that's really... A sad reality. So I'm convinced about classical theism and and the sort that I'm defending here of maximal maximal divine simplicity. But at the same time, we gotta really recognize that you know even the most ardent defenders of this throughout history realize that this is a serious mystery. You know, and if this is a serious mystery, and um, we're trying to deal with the deepest things of God, there has to be a lot of room for real dialogue and real conversations to happen, even though we have firm boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, I really appreciate the fact that there are thinkers who are willing to ask hard questions about this um, claim that we're making, even though it's a very Catholic and deeply um, universal claim within our tradition. So that's the first thing that I got to say about that. I mean, yeah. I don't want to echo the kind of cancel culture that we're seeing around the world right. today. Totally. That's a good word. Yeah. 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 And, and so with regard to uh, Oliver Crisp's model, I think what motivates him is, um, at least from the from his own chapter on this and the symposia is that he really wants to extend this as a kind of toy model or example that he keeps bringing up that that word of a toy model that this is just a kind of olive branch to to throw out there to mediate between kind of hardcore classical theist folks and also at the same time uh what some have called you know the personalist folks who want to say that God is in a give and take relationship with the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, he wants to say, hey, you can affirm lots of the metaphysical commitments of the classical theist without also sacrificing, you know, coherent language. So something like saying that God's love and God's wisdom are really one and the same thing. That doesn't yeah. make any sense. How does that even, uh, how does that, how does it work, right? So here's a model of classical theism that doesn't sacrifice the real distinction between God's love and God's wisdom. Uh, so I think he really wants to, to give this as a kind of olive branch. And also, I think, you know, he mentioned this in his chapter as well. You know, the work of Ryan Mullins yeah. has been really important for him because Mullins has really, you know, shown that there is a real worry here about the modal collapse arguments. Is creation collapsible to something necessary because of what we say about divine simplicity? Um, and uh, the identity thesis, basically, that all of God's attributes are simply one and the same thing. That that makes little sense, especially for analytic philosophers who are very concerned about precision and <laughs> and, and making sure that all our language is coherent, right? So, right. I think those are his motivations. Okay. Um, okay. So, I think we have a decent. I mean, we I've covered this with Dr. Crisp as well. Um, I think we have a decent take on Crisp model. And we have a little bit into uh, who he is and, and why he's, he does stuff like this. And I, I likewise with you, I, I really appreciate him doing this. When he did the whole, you can be a libertarian and a Calvinist, I was like, I was in like the cage stage back then. And I was like, what is he doing? Dr. Chris, no. Um, now I've come to really appreciate him just trying to push the boundaries and say like, what, what, yeah, what should we believe? What can we believe? Is this absolutely necessary that we believe this if you're this? And I do appreciate, I'm sure some people really are still bothered by that, but I do appreciate the the uh, olive branch. I've seen some of my philosopher friends say, hey, I could affirm Crisp's um, uh, parsimonious model. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. Maybe maybe keep coming. I'm always up in the air about where I'm at right now. But um, now I'm talking with you and you're a maximal, sim uh, maximalist concerning simplicity. And so maybe I'll be leaning more towards your way. Um, but Gray, what are some of like the tenets of theology proper of the doctrine of God, uh, which the maximal model um, is seeking to like guard? What 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 work is it doing, and and why is it necessary to to affirm this model? Why should anyone hold the maximal simplicity? 
Yeah, so I think what's really um, at stake with regard to this model is the, like I mentioned before, absolute perfection of God and also the mm -hmm. absolute distinction between God and everything else. So the creator-creature distinction. Yeah. So um, the divine simplicity model that I'm trying to uphold here, and its defenders have said that basically what simplicity is protecting is a self-sufficiency of God. Yeah. That God's attributes are not something that he has gained he did not have to achieve anything outside of God in order for him to become love or in order for him to become wisdom, but rather he was always loved. He was always wise. And before an eternity passed prior to creation, he was self-existently love. Mm -hmm. He was love simply and absolutely, as I would uh, always echo in class. So basically what it's trying to say is that unlike other creatures, which have these attributes in a contingent way, in a fluctuating way, are we could be loving at one moment and we could cease to be loving in another moment. God is pure actuality, right? That's the mm -hmm. terminology that, that the scholastics have used with regard to God. Um, it's so that we can say that God's love is a faithful love. God's wisdom is a faithful wisdom. And another thing that's really uh, important to them, and this is what I try to highlight in my own uh, re brief response to uh, Oliver, is that his attributes all are identifying the same divine essence. So when we're talking about God's love, it's a wise love. Yeah. It's when we're talking about God's justice, it's a wise justice, it's a loving justice. And we're talking about God's perfections. All of his perfections are bound up with one another. And so I try to say that if you make a distinction, a real distinction and not just a conceptual distinction between God's love and God's wisdom, then that means that his love conceptually, right, and really is distinct from God's wisdom. And if that's the case, that means God's love is not an essentially loving wisdom. And it's not necessarily a wise love. Mm. So that you can really pick out these two different things within God, really, and not just conceptually. So I try to say, if that's the case, then God's love in and of itself is not a wise love, but rather it needs this other attribute, namely wisdom, for it to be a wise love. Okay, and then well I try to say, oh, go ahead. Well, dude, okay, that's it's it's starting to fall together for me. So, if um, this is uh, premise six of of Crisp's uh, parsimonious model that God has distinct attributes that He exemplifies, and that's exactly what you're targeting and saying, no, it He doesn't have distinct attributes because if He did, then you have a, you can have a distinction between love and mercy, love and wisdom. So, in order for Him to have like loving wisdom, He would have to bring those together. Uh, in the story of history or something, and it would seem like he's moving from potential, the potential to bring those together, to act of those two being together. So love and wisdom, being a love wisdom, or loving wisdom, or wise love. Is that yeah. right? Is, 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 that, is that what you're saying, or am I just making that up? That, no, that's, that's definitely a potential worry. Though I think Oliver would say that uh, God always has all of his attributes essentially right so it's not it's yeah. never the case that god accrued wisdom at some point of time right. but rather god always has these attributes essentially but they right. still remain distinct with one another right and so not if just conceptually but really right if, if they're really distinct then uh it, it might be a concern that in order to bring them together well then he's moving from from potential to act right if they're not one substance if it's if his wisdom isn't his love then to have loving wisdom, he has the potential to have loving wisdom, right? So I'm not saying that he's a, uh, he's acquiring love, and he's or nor is he acquiring wisdom. You can still say that he had those from all eternity past, but in order to have this loving wisdom, the two working together, he needs the <clears throat> story of creation in order to do that. And so he's moving from p potential to actuality. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think it de definitely makes sense. And I think with regard to other more parsimonious models of divine simplicity than my work, I think, again, Oliver would probably say something like, there was never a moment where God was without his love or without his wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so creation didn't really add anything to God in that respect. Mm -hmm. But I would want to say that if, if God's love is really distinct from God's wisdom, then God's love is in potency with regard to wisdom. Hmm. In and of itself, God's love is without wisdom. Wisdom is a completely different thing right it's, yeah. a, it's a different property entirely so what what the classical tradition that want to say is that god's love is only love if it is one with wisdom yeah. god's wisdom is only wise only if it is one with love 
so that God's love is not in potency with regard to any other attribute, but rather God's love is self-actualizing love precisely because it is one with all of his other attributes, that all of these ad other attributes have to be identical with one another for it to be truly love or truly wisdom or truly whatever else you want to say about God, yeah. if that makes sense. So, um, and, and that's something that, that I think Futi has tried to, to make uh, that claim there. And so when, when you read other folks, not just Futius, but also, you know, someone like Bavink or Tiritan, they would always say that when we're saying that God's love and wisdom are identical with God, we're making here in our minds still a distinction of reason, right? That conceptually speaking, in terms of our ideas, Tiritan says, right. love and wisdom are always different things. Mm -hmm. They're always different things. But given our convictions about analogical reasoning, what is different in our minds are actually one in God. Yeah. So this is how they actually apply analogical reasoning with regard to our, our speech about God, that though our ideas are necessarily different with regard to God's love and God's wisdom in God, they're always one and the same thing because the thing signified always transcends the mode of signification. Yeah. And how does it transcend the mode of signification? Well, in God, it's one thing, but in our minds, the ideas are different things. Hmm. Um, and so it's almost like they've anticipated this worry of, well, aren't you saying, therefore, that God's love and God's wisdom are just the same? But in our minds, it's, it's always different. How do, how do we make sense of that? How can conceive of that? And they're not bothered by it. They're, they're like saying, you know, well, this is why I believe in the doctrine of analogy. That whatever we say about God, it's always going, God himself transcends our mode of signifying. And and so we they, they were completely fine with saying, in our minds, they're different, sure, and we can't conceive otherwise. But it doesn't mean that in God that they're different. They're right. always the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love that. And some of my philosopher friends, I say some, because I do have some philosopher friends who are classical theists, but many of them kind of chafe at analogical language. And they say, well, there's still some univocal core. And I still, I, I think I still reject that there's a univocal core because analogy is a way to speak literally, but not univocally uh, and not uh, equivocally. It's, it's uh, able, you're able to stretch the concept such that you're able to still speak literally. And so I, I chafe or I get all worked up about this because I wrote on the authorial analogy and God's like yeah. an author. You're right. So um, I love analogical knowledge, uh, analogical language as well. And I know the same people who, many of whom are rejecting simplicity, are saying, well, fine, like, I'm, I don't even like analogical knowledge. I think we only should speak univocally of God. But I think the way you just said it, putting them together, it shows, it makes sense. Like, and it, it's been uh, drawn out in James Anderson's, uh, uh, in his uh, di dissertation turned book, where it would make sense because of the creator-creature distinction that uh, we would speak analogically about God and that we would be different in the way that I have wisdom would be different than the way God has wisdom. And so it, it would make sense that we wouldn't be able to fully uh, understand simplicity or that God's attributes all being one are different than mine coming and going and being parts and different properties and stuff like that. So they, they go right, together yeah. so nicely. Yeah. And, you know, I, I really like James Anderson's way of, of talking about this. It's a merely apparent contradiction yeah. due to unarticulated equivocation and i think that's a really good way of, of putting it so the equivocation is there somewhere but it's in god uh but but i think to push to push it even further you know again when you read someone like a bovink or a tiritan and, and futius and bonaventure thomas on this um they're really not concerned with making sense of how our language works when it comes to refer to god yeah. Not that they just say things that are contradictory. Of course, they care about committing a contradiction. You know, they don't want to do that. Right. But in so far as they're trying to protect God's perfections, if it stretches our language, then they say, so be it. You yeah. know, it, it, it never really worried them to the extent that, well, if I can't conceive of love and wisdom as one and the same thing, that means it must be also different than God. They never reasoned that way. Yeah. But rather, human conceivability um can be stretched in so far as you want to protect god's perfections and attributes and god's absolute transcendence in that way so it's a, it's a different priority i think with regard yeah. to what they were trying to achieve when it comes to the doctrine of god well so gray i think that's a really important point and that's kind of where that's kind of represents the internal kind of wavering or battle going on in my own head because it, one side of me prioritizes um exactly what what Vodius and aquinas and saying, hey, look, dude, if I can't figure out 
uh, everything about God. So what? So like a mystery has always been a part of this and it makes sense. And they pull out some James Anderson and actually uh, Dr. Crisp uses Anderson's work in this book and he does something similar with yeah. transcendence. Uh, he just, he just used the language of transcendence instead of um, just creator creature uh, distinction. But the other part of me uh, is reading analytic philosophy all the time. And it's like, well, I have to be able to explain this to my non-Christian and uh, philosopher friends or to myself or to the more ana analytically inclined or less historically minded. And that kind of represents the battle. And I think it does have to do with your, your prior commitments um, or maybe you're not, not, I don't want to say commitments because that makes it sound like it's a, a moral thing or something, but uh, dis disposition, like some people are more mm -hmm. historically minded or more okay with, Hey, there's some mystery here. Some people punt and they say that mystery way too, too early. Others want to see mm -hmm. how far we can push this limit. And I think the sweet spot is somewhere saying like, I want to affirm what history affirmed. I want to affirm what, what faithful Orthodox Christian affirmed and I want to push it, but I'm going to push it knowing like I'm never going to reach fully because of the doctrine of analogy and creator creature distinction. And hey, look, if I can't figure it out, that's okay with me. I'm not gonna lose any sleep over it. I, that's where I want to be, at least. If even if that's not the most, per I, to me, it seems like the via media. It sounds like the perfect way to go, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So I mean, that's that's another thing that I wanted to establish in my brief essay as well is that divine simplicity is consistent with epistemic modesty. Mm -hmm. That you don't have because you know you see that thrown around all the time that the maximal classical theist is really immodest when it comes to predicating things about God because they're yeah. saying all these wild things about God, right? Mm -hmm. But really, why are they saying so much about God is precisely because they're they're almost kind of like groping at the words to mention and to talk about and to predicate about this sublime, divine, transcendent reality. Yeah. And as they're trying to describe the sublime, divine, transcendent reality, um, they have key dispositions and commitments that they want to uphold with regard to God's perfections. So mm -hmm. there's this mystery in front of them and they want to say that God is absolutely perfect. So what kind of language do we use to describe this perfection of God? Yeah. And whatever language that eschews or brings God down, so to speak, and makes God more like a creature, whatever that is, we're going to be against that mm -hmm. without denying this mystery that is in front of us. So they, they definitely have, so when we're talking about mystery, we're not talking about mysticism. They're not just going to say, right. here's all the stuff that we say about God and this is all contradictory, but who cares? No, but they're saying, God is perfect. And here's some language that makes him more like a creature. We're going to be against that. We're going to preserve the language that preserves God's perfection and God's mysteriousness. And to them, you know, the doctrine of divine simplicity has done that work or the doctrine of God's absoluteness, whatever you want to call it. Right. And and the history thing is, is more weighty than I think we, we consider because there are real differences between some of these folks. You know, something that I mentioned at the beginning of the essay is that, you know, the... Franciscan Bonaventure and the Dominican Aquinas, you know, they defer on a lot of things, really. It's, it's almost like they're rival schools in a lot of ways. Yeah. But both are still going to say God is pure actuality. Yeah, we got to stand on that. You know, yeah. they might define that a little bit differently, but they say, no, God is pure actuality. And, you know, Futius, he would say, whether you want to use scotistic language or Thomistic language, God is pure actuality, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so and Bavink does the same thing um, where he says that the doctrine of divine simplicity, though there are different ways of describing it in some technicalities, it's it's running across our Christian tradition. Um, and it's not capitulating to Greek philosophy to do that. Yeah. You know, that's that's another claim that he tries to make. So it, it's a very it's a broad and, and wide Catholic claim that we're trying to make here. Yeah, and that's why if you're if you're going to reject simplicity, you shouldn't do it just yeah, well, I read something and it doesn't make sense to me. Like many of the church fathers, as as you just said, church fathers and scholastics, reformed scholastics, like everyone believed this. Everyone affirmed some some view of this. And so you you step off of that. Uh, you shouldn't do that lightly. I'm just saying, like, yeah, if you're convinced of it, cool. Yeah, we should still talk and all that stuff. Like, but do it carefully. Do it like considering what. The amount of, of history uh, on the, the side of that. Uh, when it comes to like actus purus, you, you had this really interesting line, actus purus. Oh, maybe I'm paraphrasing. I don't know if you actually said actus purus, but I always say that because it so makes me sound 
more smart. Um, being the, the God is pure actuality. Um, Actus Purus is an explication rather than an entailment of maximal simplicity. Can you, can you explain yeah. what that means? Yeah. So, um, Futius would argue that, um, well, not just him, I guess, the reformed scholastics would argue that any change in God is always a change from potency to actuality. So in other words, um, that's how they define change. It's not just in so far as te- a kind of temporal change or a physical part that's changing, but rather any kind of change is always a change between potency to actuality. Yeah. So uh, if there is no distinction in God, there's no, I mean, there's no composition within God, um, and there's no composition within God, therefore, between act and potency, it's not an entailment to move from composition to pure actuality. Because if you're denying composition, then there is no composition between act and potency within uh-huh. God. And we're denying potency altogether. Then it follows that God is pure actuality. It's an explication of what it means to say that God is not composed of parts. Yeah. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay. So so that and that the point there is uh, if you're going to say God is simple... It's the same thing as saying God is pure act. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, because yeah. you're denying any kind of potency with regard to God. So yeah. if you're denying any kind of potency, then by definition, God is pure actuality. He's just yeah. actuality, in other words. Yeah. Yeah, because there there's no potential to be actualized. It's it's just just actual. Yeah. Right. Just pure right. pure actual pure act actus purus. Okay. That's interesting. That one never bothered. I know some people really get bothered by that. I like that language because I don't want an inert God, right? I don't want God to be just totally inert until he decided to create and then he starts loving creatures and stuff. But if he's always, so I just think of act and maybe that's, that's what's throwing me off. But if he's always speaking, always talking, you know, always um, uh, engaged in, in pure blessedness as uh, the, re- the reformers mm-hmm. would say, um, that's a kind of God that makes sense of scripture like that. That's awesome. I love that. And I, I just intuitively, uh, think that arguments sound that anything moving from any change is either change for the better or the worse. And so any move from, uh, potential to act would be either God's getting greater or he's getting less great. And neither, none of us can say either one of those. So I know there's a lot of other arguments against simplicity, but those two for simplicity just seems so intuitive to me. It seems like it makes so much sense. Yeah, I mean, I definitely would like to think so, right? And um, when you read someone like a Bonaventure, this this becomes pretty wild because, and I think you'd appreciate this, Parker, mm-hmm. because there's a kind of transcendental edge to to Bonaventure's reasoning yeah. here. He basically says that for you to know any kind of thing in potentiality or any kind of thing that is mutable underneath that you have to know something that is immutable and mm-hmm. pure actuality so he says if you can make a, a distinction in your mind between something that is less good and more good in the back of your mind you must remember something that is pure pure goodness yeah so if you, if, if you can adjudicate between different objects of evaluation you might want mm-hmm. to put it that way um it, it shows that you remember an infinite goodness by which you make this distinction between less and better forms of goodness. So he actually says, for you to know any kind of mutable being, you need to know the immutable God who is pure act. Hmm. Um, yeah. and, and you know, he's really just riffing off Augustine there, and and yeah. Augustine was using Plato. You know, he like when you when you see things out there, you're actually remembering things. Yeah, the doctrine Plato of re- recollection. Soul. Yeah, right, the doctrine of recollection. But now it's not that you're recollecting the pre-existent self and what your past existence before you enter the body, but rather you are quote unquote, recollecting this primordial divine revelation that is in your soul, you know? So, so that's the doctrine of divine illumination according to Augustine and Bonaventure yeah, yeah. And, and it hinges upon your actuality. Yeah. That dude, I really, I, you're right. I really do like that. And, um, it, it reminds me of, of your work and Corey's work, um, uh, in tracing Bobbing's thought to Schleiermacher. And everyone yeah. just lost their mind if they didn't if they didn't know that. But uh, absolute dependence, right? And it's a similar kind of move of saying like, okay, well, just keep tracing that back, uh, and you have these ideas of God. And uh, I don't know, maybe right. I'm make, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but I, I see kind of a, a parallel uh, scheme, reasoning scheme there. Yeah, 
Yeah, and and when Bavink was talking about Schlarmacher in Philosophy of Revelation, he traced it back to Augustine. Oh, right, um, right. August, Augustine said, you know, when you are encountering finite things, you remember these infinite realities that are in your own soul. And yeah. that's how you understand these finite things. And for Schlarmacher, when you are relatively dependent on finite things, you remember your absolute dependence on God, precisely yeah. because the objects of your relative dependence and yourself are both dependent upon this higher unity, namely in God. So structurally, it's similar. Yeah. But for Augustine, it's way more intellectualistic. There's fully formed ideas within the soul. But for Schleiermacher, it's this primordial affection. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a great distinction there. I wonder, so I'm always interested in Descartes, because Descartes got a really bad rap from many of uh, the Vantillians out there, probably from Van Til himself. And I went to, and I read Descartes myself, and I, I like Descartes. Um, not, I'm not a Cartesian, but I, I like what he's doing. And he, his ontological argument is kind of like a midway between the Schleiermachian uh, primordial, something going on, maybe a little bit more mystical or romantic uh, going on, and Augustine's conceptual model, where it's it's dependence, but it's kind of this conceptual dependence. That's really interesting. Someone should write a paper about uh, the three of those. That's that's awesome. Yeah, man. I really, I really, really, really like that. Um, yeah. I so what you're detecting there is that there, there's multiple kinds of that kind of transcendental reasoning. It's not, yeah. it's not, it's not peculiar to just one tradition. Yeah. Right. Yeah, dude. I love, I love it. I love it so much. Um, threw me off totally with that. Cause that's, that's so good. I'm, I'm trying not to just stay the rest of the time on that, but, uh, sure. There, there's, there's, so planning, I wrote this book. Um, does God have a nature? I forgot. Hmm. I forgot the name of the book, but he, everyone uses it to kind of just dump on simplicity nowadays, but there's a sovereignty, a saity intuition. And you, you brought yeah. it up in the paper as well. Um, why is the sovereignty, a saity intuition, not enough? Like, why do we need to go full blown simplicity? I guess. Well, well, it's, it's not that it's not enough, I guess it's, it's, it's definitely, it's highlighting something really important, I suppose. Yeah. You know, um, that that God, God's sovereignty means that He's completely self-sufficient, right? Mm -hmm. So that He depends on nothing for Him to be who He is. And so, you know, Planinga said, "Well, that means if that's the case, that means you know God is identical to His own properties, and that means God is a property." <laughs> I mean, that that's kind of the implication of divine simplicity. Right. And I want to say, what if His property just is Himself? So, rather than saying that God is a property, His essence is His personal being so um i mean oh yeah it's, it's just about priority in that respect but um, oh yeah dude that's uh, good yeah so I, I think that that objection has a priority all wrong if you just say that god is a property you could just flip it around and instead of you know implying that god is an impersonal property why don't you just say that his property or his essence is a personal being yeah um so that you're 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 prioritizing his agency and his divinity over his property talk. You know, I, I don't understand yeah. why we, we, we can't do it that way. But anyway, so I, I want to go beyond that and and say that, you know, there's the fontality intuition. That, I, that did, did you God make that up? I, I, I wrote that down. Did you make up? Is that your language? It's it's, bon, it's Bonaventure's language, a fontality. Okay. Um, fontality. I love it. Yeah. Uh, you know, but but. Bavink, I think, refers to it as kind of as God's offness. God is off himself. Um, you know, that's the language of Westminster standards as well, that God's of himself. Yeah. God is of himself. Yeah. Is that um, hexaity? Is, it, is there a Latin hexaity or something like that? Uh, I, I mean, it goes beyond hexaity, right? That, that it's not okay. just you're particular to yourself, but rather um, God's love is of himself god's goodness is of himself god's wisdom is of himself so it's not just that god has goodness but rather goodness is of god you know okay. god is of himself not that god is self-caused but right, that right. he is the fecund overflowing abundant font of goodness yeah he is he he's the eternal living goodness right yeah um so so uh the fontality intuition is what I think is going on in, in the Westminster standards that God is blessedness in and of himself. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that he has blessedness, but he has of himself with regard to blessedness, for example. Okay. Uh, I, I can't help but bring this up, but I think it was in the end of your book. And I can't remember if this was original to Bavink or, or to you, but 
the font language reminded me that uh, there's this line that you used. God is the font of all intelligibility. And uh, I loved it, dude. I, it, it like it drew out, I think, really important things in, in Ventilion, in Ventil's project, that that's really what you want to say, that God is the font of all intelligibility. There's no um, that that's it. All intelligibility comes from him and bubbles out of him and not just bubbles. It's not an emanation, but it's a divine choice. But uh, I thought that was awesome. And, and so, again, like a similar, though, that's more in, in, uh, intellectual, the uh, intelligibility language like this. Uh, likewise, God is the is the fount. It's all of him. So in, intelligibility for my uh, interests is of God. God, like there's no intelligibility outside of him. Yeah. And, and you know, I want to say that this is particularly an Augustinian line. This is a, mm -hmm. this is illumination according to Augustine. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, Scott McDonald has an essay on Augustine's illumination. And I think that's the kind of language that he would use as well. That, you know, Psalm 36, nine, that in this light, we see light, that yeah. God is light in and of himself. Yeah. And so any kind of intelligibility with regard to the world is traceable back to God because God is the illumining light through whom yeah. we see everything else. And so when we see things outside of us, we remember God's light within us. That's what Augustine would say. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's very deeply, I think, Augustinian intuition that permutates itself in different ways in different traditions. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that there's, there's, there's such a strong historical foundation there for that claim. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I, I need to get into more, uh, illumination, stuff because uh it, it's so good and i i first found it in c.s lewis actually in miracles he he's got this really strong idea of augustinian divine illumination and from there i was just predisposed to finding it once i started reading augustine and and from there so i'm really excited to get into some more of that but uh when it getting getting back to simplicity here so you've quoted a lot of reforms classics and i love that i'm all excited about that uh, maybe already enough to dispel this charge of of Thomism, but I, I figure we might as well bring it up anyways. And because you you brought it up in the paper, that a lot of people will say this is just, um, it's just Aquinas. You're you're a Thomist if you if you believe this, uh, this maximal uh, doctrine of simplicity. Uh, what do you make of that charge? That this is just down from Aquinas. That you're just you know re, yeah yeah repersonating his uh, model. I'd say I'd say two things to that charge. First is that, you know, to make that charge work, you need to isolate Thomas from his medieval and patristic context. Mm. And I think you yeah. can't do that. So okay. Thomas was really receiving a patristic tradition. He wasn't I mean, he 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 highly conceptualized it even further, for sure. And mm. his is one of the most mature forms of divine simplicity, for sure. But he was really just echoing an Augustinian patristic consensus with regard yeah. to the doctrine of divine simplicity. So we can't isolate him from his past. And and secondly, you can't isolate him from his uh, um, uh, his his reception either. So in other words, the Reformed were living in that medieval context where they were reading folks like Scotus, Aquinas, and Bonaventure, like the Franciscan and Dominican traditions and so on. So they're working with the distinctions that they inherited from these figures. Um, so that the Reformed used Aquinas as one figure among many. So they were not afraid of Thomas. Yeah. They continually used the concepts that they saw was resident in Thomas, not because they were just committed to Thomism self-consciously, right. but because they were committed to these concepts that have been universally used, not just in Aquinas, but also in everyone else before Aquinas. Mm. So one of the things that I wanted to say is that Aquinas was definitely one of the most mature forms of divine simplicity. And I also want to add that Aquinas is one of the best sources on the Trinity available uh, to the reformers and even till today, but we can't isolate him that this is not just a Thomistic claim, but this was a, a very universally broad claim that Thomas happens to be one um, exponent, mature exponent of. Um, so that's what I would say to that, to that claim. Okay. No, that's great. That's a really great point. I think we often, I am guilty of that. Just thinking like, because he was such a huge figure, I mean, you got to give it to him. Uh, I always think like, here's Thomas and he's here and he, he's kind of doing his own thing, but he's trying to, he, even if he did add to it or whatever, he's trying uh, to be faithful to those who came before him. And he probably is. And uh, 
I just think that's a great point that, that, yeah, he is historically situated and you have to look at his, uh, seat. What is it? Seats in Laban. Like you have to view yeah. him in, yeah. in his, yeah, it's another, another $5 yeah, situation word. is contact. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think, you know, so part of that is giving credit where credit is due. He's very important, but it's also don't give him all the credit, you know, right. because he's not just, he's not the only one doing this. And so the reformed were using all these sorts of tools. And this is why I really love Bobbing's reformed eclecticism, where, you know, he's very critical of someone like Aquinas, but also freely uses him. And that's what you see in the reformed classics too. They were very critical of him in, in some ways, but also they would use him in other ways. And not just him, but also other figures um, in our broader Catholic tradition. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really great point, dude. I gotta I gotta think on this more. This is like uh, live. This is a live debate in my head right now. I have like some Sim- Simplicity Park and and non Simplicity Park, and their dudes are always battling in my head. Uh, so as we as we close up here, I wanted to bring up just two objections, two more objections that you you didn't treat in the paper, um, right? And you, it's not like you you avoided them or anything. The the paper's awesome. Uh, one is from Ryan Mullins, who is a re- reoccurring guest here, and he's the boogeyman, and I love him, and I'm terrified of him. Uh, he's great, and he's he's awful, and I love him, but I hate him. <laughs> uh, anyone who knows him knows that's that's who he is. But so it, it comes out of this uh, fantastic book, the TNT Clark Handbook of Analytic Theology. Someone uh, on this podcast may have uh, also helped Dr. Akadi pick out this uh, cover. I'm not saying someone did or didn't, but that's kind of a big deal and did the index. Another another person on this podcast has another important chapter in here, which is huge. But uh, Dr. Mullen's chapter, Ryan Mullen's chapter, uh, he's he's got a chapter on classical theism, and he brings up this problem of modal collapse. And I don't think we're going to solve this here. This is a really hard problem. Maybe, maybe you will. But I just want to get your thoughts on it because – it's a live question for me. Maybe you can help me. Maybe you can commiserate with me. But uh, just just bear with me, folks. I'm going to read the argument. So uh, premise one, if God intentionally acts to actualize this world, then this world cannot possibly fail to obtain. Okay. Uh, premise two, if God's intentional act to actualize this world is absolutely necessary, then this world exists of absolute necessity. Three, God's existence is absolutely necessary. Four, anything that is identical to God's existence must be absolutely necessary. Five, all of God's intentional actions are identical to each other such that there is only one divine act. Uh, Six, God's one divine act is identical to God's existence. Uh, Seven, God's one divine act is absolutely necessary. Eight, God's intentional act to actualize this world is absolutely necessary. Nine, the world exists of absolute necessity. So it does, it It seems like from the actus purus doctrine and simplicity, uh, which you say isn't actus purus, just an explication of simplicity, which I think I agree with. It seems like if God is one act, then uh, he's a necessary being. And so his act is necessary. And then that necessity transfers all the way over into creation and, and creation is is necessary. Uh, I think I'm, I'm. I think I simplified that uh, sufficiently. But what what do you make of it? Just uh, initially, I, I know I'm just bringing it up to you, and it's not like the paper was about this or anything. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 definitely great. And like you said about you know Ryan Mullins, uh, his work is an important work, and I've made this claim multiple times to multiple people. But instead of fighting one another, reform people should just focus on responding to guys like him. Seriously, right? team um, up. Be- yeah. I know, yeah. So, I mean, rather than getting into your little denominational squabbles, here's someone that you should take seriously and respond to. And I really respect his work in that regard. He's very clear. Yeah. And I've, I've always uh, admired that. Um, so, yeah, so I think the modal collapse argument is basically the claim that if God is identical with himself, then God is identical with his acts. And so modally, you're going to collapse all of his acts. There's no distinction between contingent actual acts, sorry, not actuality, but contingent actions and necessary actions. So that God's free act of creation, yeah. which maybe intuitively you might think has to be a contingent act, becomes a necessary act because God is identical to all of his actions. So it's a modal collapse in that regard. It collapses all contingencies and necessity with regard to yeah. God's actions. Um, so... Here's what I'd say to that, perhaps. I would say, 
the one, it's a very perplexing argument for sure. And it's one that we need to take seriously. And um, there's multiple ways in which the scholastics have with more or less clarity and success responded to. But here's here's the thing that, that keeps me going with regard to divine simplicity despite this argument is that they were all aware of this argument and mm. none of them were bothered by it. Mm. So, so, so it's not it's not so much that I find their answers were all equally compelling. So Aquinas says, God always wills himself. Hence, you know, the way he wills himself is through the willing of creation to share in that goodness of himself. Now, it's it's a very, in my mind, it's still a very convoluted way to, to say it. Um, yeah. It's not it's not a very it's not a very um, quickly, you know, intelligible. It's not it's not it's not something that is conceivable very quickly let's just put it yeah that way. it wasn't very analytic um, of him yeah yeah and you know a lot of folks are probably going to get angry because i said that but um it's one possible response he, he has said that in matthew levering and engaging the doctrine of creation has echoed a version of it um and you know stephen Duby has responded to it using the reform scholastics as well talking about how the uh the virtues of god or the the powers of god can be manifested in a free way and again it's all, I think, still mysterious in my own mind of how yeah. exactly to respond to it. And again, all these different ways of responding to it um, can have varying successes. But the key thing that I've noticed in my readings of all of these figures is that they were all aware of this objection and it never bothered them. Hmm. So so to me, if you have 1,800 years of, of, of figures who are aware of this objection, it's not new to them. Um, you know, and, and I think analytic guys oftentimes bring it up as if it's new. Yeah. Um, they miss that they were all aware of it and they were not bothered by it. And mm. to me, if it, it, it never bothered anyone and they still continue to claim what they claimed while addressing it, um, that's still a good reason enough for me to uphold what they said about this doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that gets back to like the, um, the disposition as well, that if you, if yeah. you have a, this disposition that like I need to figure everything out, um, you're not going to be satisfied with that at all. But if you if you have a disposition to saying like, hey, I I trust. If you're a confessional and saying, hey, look, I've read the the dudes who wrote this confession. I know them. I know that they actually love the Lord. I've heard. I've read their personal journals that have been republished. I read their you know their theology. I trust them. Um, they're smart, and I'm I'm following them in this. Then you're gonna say, yeah, yeah, I, I definitely. So I think that's really it's. I used to bother me a ton that God gave us all these different intuitions. Now I see it as like, He did it for our good. He did it for the church's good, and I we need to come together on that. But uh, yeah, yeah. De depending on your intuitions, you're gonna say, I like that, or that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, again, all of the reformed always upheld that creation was a free act of God. Yeah. So, you know, classical distinction between God's ordained power on the one hand and God's absolute power on the other hand. Mm. God has absolute power to do whatever he wills, but yet at the same time, he only ordained this world. And so mm. um, that implies that this is a free act and they all affirm that this is a free act, even though they kept saying that God is his action, yeah. right? Um, so it never bothered them. And they still maintain that God's creation was, was a free act of creation. Yeah. Okay. So let's not let's not throw that off and just say fine. Di divine emanation is is okay. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. Exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, so Gary, I wanted to finish up with one thing, and it's from Bavink, so it's right up your alley. Um, it's from the Christian worldview that that, that you yeah. helped translate. Uh, Bavink says Christian philosophy could also appropriate the Platonic Aristotelian doctrine of ideas. Um, so for those who aren't aware, it's the, the forms. Oh, he says uh, the forms in a modified sense. Indeed, we cannot arrive at the account of things without such forms. But these forms are not to be handled as, in the Kantian sense, categories that we apply to the matter of perception by our own spiritual industry. They are rather neither something subjective alone nor something passive that is carried into the material of our perception, but they are to be considered objective ideas, which give order and coherence to the multiplicity of parts and bind them in organic unity. Okay, and then he goes on and says, um, 
He says, the agreement between the teachings of Scripture and Platonism between the doctrine of wisdom and the Logos doctrine of the Bible on the one hand and the Logos speculation of the Greek philosophy on the other may not overlook the great distinction. According to Scripture, ideas have no objective metaphysical existence outside God, but rather exist only in his divine being. And and I love that. I agree with that. It's this doctrine um, of divine conceptual realism that the Platonic forms are concepts or, or ideas in God's mind, and Bavink goes f- so far as to say they exist in his divine being. And so mm-hmm. uh, this is not like a gotcha or anything like that. This is like, this is hard for me because I'm a divine conceptual realist and I want to affirm simplicity, but it seems like those two might be at odds with each other because if his I- if everything in God is God, then his ideas are him, but his idea of me seems like it is distinct. Like what, just initially, what, what do you make of that? Yeah. I mean, this is a tough, tough question. And, um, I, I probably agree with divine conceptual realism in that respect that, you know, you had Thomas Ward here, so he could probably answer this question yeah. better than I can. And I'm, I haven't listened to that episode, but I should, but I'm, I'm guessing this response a good one. would be better than mine. What did you say? It's a good one. We actually, everyone was really upset because we didn't quite get to this. Uh, so we kind of come back on and we're going to deal with this a little bit more. Yeah, so I'll, I'll anticipate that particular episode there, Parker. But yeah, um, yeah so I, I would want to say something about um, God's ideas are eternally within God. Yes, that's exactly right. And he is identical with his knowledge. But there's still a difference between his absolute knowledge, that is himself, mm-hmm. and also his um, the ordained created realities that comes out of his creative power. So... Um, is this, is this necessary and free? Are you making that distinction between necessary knowledge and free knowledge? Yeah, that's exactly the right. kind of distinction I want to make. Okay. <clears throat> so he has absolutely, you know, he, he has knowledge of all of his powers, um, but that's still distinct from what he freely brings about in creation, namely you and I, right? So uh, prior to creation, he has perfect knowledge of anything that could be and everything that would be but only his free will decides what would actually take place, what it would actually bring be brought about within creation in the spatio-temporal realm of the creaturely order. So something to that effect, and that doesn't really answer the question, perhaps, but um, I, I don't have any problems with saying that God knows what he could do and what God knows his perfect power and that which is within the realm of possibility because he determines possibility. Mm-hmm. So something like that. Okay. Um, uh, and then I would resort to, you know, what Tyrion said about whatever is formally distinct within our minds are essentially one within God. So whatever forms or ideas that we have within our minds that are always distinct in our minds are always one and the same within God. And he always says that. Um, mm. So it never bothered him either <laughs> that, yeah. that this could be an objection. So, yeah, that's what I would say. Well, OK, so so following up on that, the um, the distinction between necessary and free knowledge uh is is that just a distinction that we can make because we're in the prism of creation and we see the refracted light? Like, is is God's necessary and free knowledge? Is that does that like boil down to one because of simplicity? Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, and again, it comes back to the modal collapse objection, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, logically, I think you would want to say it must boil down to one. But okay. without collapsing the one from the other. <laughs> so, okay. uh, again, I could already imagine analytic guys preparing their stones to throw at me. <laughs> but um, um, so, yeah, conceptually and logically, I could say that it is definitely an entailment that God, if all of God's actions are ones, mm-hmm. then God's necessary free acts are one thing. Um, sure, but uh, I could see that going there. But um, I'm going to affirm the paradox. I'm going to say that. God's necessary and free acts are still distinct, but one. It's distinct in our minds, but one within God. And we don't know how yeah. that they, yeah. they work together in that way. And that might not, that's just the problem with all the attributes for us, viewing them from this side of creation. So it might seem particularly uh, tricky here with necessary and free knowledge, but it's also the same with wisdom and love and justice and mercy. Uh, that's just, that's the problem of the, finite creature trying to reason about the simple necessary God, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, even Boving said that technically speaking and strictly speaking, there is no foreknowledge in God. 
because there's no before or after in God. Um, oh, okay. So, yeah. uh, so he would say that technically speaking, anything that we say about God's ordained power, absolute power, or necessary and free knowledge, it's all anthropomorphic. It's because we yeah. have to think it this way. We have to think about the architect who plants the house and then builds the house. Yeah. Um, but with regard to God, technically, there is no before or after. There is no moment where uh, God didn't have a plan and then he actualized a plan. Um, and again, so it, it, he, he, that's what he says. And then suddenly he says, here's this distinction between necessary and free knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. We have and to it, talk it, analogically. Yeah. Yeah, dude. It, start, it starts blowing your mind. And I think, again, based on your on your intuitions and your, you know, preconceived notions and your all everything that, that has led to you listening to this podcast, uh, you're going to go a couple of different ways. One might be, this is blowing my mind. So it must be crazy. Another one is this is blowing my mind. So I, I got to think about this more. Another is this is blowing my mind. And it, it just leads me to worship God that Holy cow. He's so different than us. He's so, so different. He's so unique and amazing and, and blessed as, uh, the reformers yeah. say like i'm i'm somewhere in between all three of those that's why i know that i'm the delta of like i'm my mind is blown and sometimes i'm thinking it's crazy other times i'm like this is opening my eyes to how different and awesome god is and the other is just like dude i just want to worship god that's that's huge that's amazing that's crazy yeah and you know it's it's the limitations of our logical reasoning and you know david louis i think you probably had him as a professor yeah i love at, dr at, right? louis he's the man yeah, um, he has an essay on on Bonaventure and maximal simplicity, and he says exactly that. Like his, the priorities of the medievals and the ancients are very different than our contemporary age with regards to the doctrine of God. Hmm. So their priorities are always whatever exalts God's perfections, whatever exalts His distinctness from us. That's what we're going to prioritize in our theological engineering. But uh, today, it's more about how do we make best sense of this with regard yeah, to our it's own. Exactly sense, different. Like yeah, that's. Yeah, that's a great point. Wow. Okay. Well, maybe I got to get Dr. Louis on to talk about that paper now. Yeah, yeah you should, you definitely should. It was a great paper. I actually emailed him um, because I appreciated it so much. Um, another thing, Parker, I, I think I'll say this because you like Van Til so much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is an application of what Van Til calls supplementative concepts or limiting concepts, right? Yeah. Right. That that if you're gonna think univocally, you're gonna use god's sovereignty to deny man's responsibility mm -hmm. or you're going to use god's you know predestination to deny common grace because this is this is what the denials of common grace were saying you know they were saying if god had predestined who would be saved and who would be damned from before the foundation of the world then it must follow that god always hates the reprobate there is no sense of favor with regard to the reprobate with respect to god's um uh disposition towards them and so he says we're going to be tempted to draw out these logical entailments from one claim to another mm -hmm. because our mind has to think it that way. But if you're, if you're going to follow supplementative concepts, you're going to uphold the paradox that God has predestined, but at the same time, he has a disposition of favor, even towards those he has ultimately predestined towards perdition. Mm -hmm. And we can't really make sense of that. We want to deny common grace if we affirm election. Yeah. But he says we have to uphold both because scripture upholds both. Yeah. And so um, it's the same, I think, with divine simplicity. There, there, We have to affirm God's absoluteness. And yet, because of the limitations of our reasoning, we have to affirm the distinction between free and necessary acts and, and so on. So mm -hmm. I, that's that's perhaps one way we can we can talk about the creator-creature distinction. Yeah, dude, that's really great. And it was a good, it was a good move pulling out Van Til. For, for those uh, who aren't familiar with Van Til or aren't familiar with limiting concepts um, and He's getting that, I believe he's getting that language from Kant about limiting concepts, or at least the, the post-Kantians. Um, but but he's using it in a very Christian way, which is awesome, which he does all the time. So it's like on a zip line, uh, at the end of the zip line, instead of just keep going and you smash into the other side of the cliff, there's like a little metal bracket thing that catches you, and you kind of swing and you go back. And that's a limiting concept. That's what Van Til's talking about. There's these limiting concepts that say kind of this far and no further, and it it's not arbitrary. It comes from scripture, but also it, I'm a systematic guy. I'm a systematic, you know, got a degree in systematic theology. It's systematic. It makes sense uh, where the limiting concepts make sense where they're placed uh, because that's, that's how God gave it to us. And so there's, mm -hmm. that's, it's the metal thing on the zip line that keeps us from smashing into the cliff. 
And if you don't have those, oftentimes you will smash into the cliff. You will deny God's sovereignty or man's free will or all sorts of uh, troubles. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. And if Augustine can use Plato and Aquinas can use Aristotle, we can use the romantics and the idealists. Yeah. And Bavink did use the romantics. So so that's what Van Til was trying to do with the post-Kantians. Yeah. Dude, this is this is awesome, man. I, I love talking with you. And uh, I really appreciate you letting me bring up like modal collapse and divine ideas. Uh, it's kind of what the, the podcast is about, just kind of getting at the the edges of our knowledge and, and seeing where how far we can go. And I'm glad you brought in limiting concepts to say that thus far and, and no further. And we have a reason for why we are holding to certain paradoxes. Uh, I really enjoyed the paper. You said a ton in a, in a short amount of words. They give you a, a as, as everyone does, but they give you a, a pretty tight uh, word limit there. And I thought you said a lot. Again, dude, I, I appreciate the way you're inter interacting with Dr. Crisp. Um, he is super generous and you are super generous. And so it was just this compounded, like people being nice and doing theology the way theology should be done, even while saying like, hey, I think you're wrong. Yeah. Well, I, I think Oliver is an inspiration to us all. And I think so much of my own charitable sort of, uh, take on things is trying to emulate him with regards to disrespect. So I, I really respect him in that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, um, okay, so they can find people can find that paper. Um, I don't even know if I said the name of it. Great, great. Do you remember the name of your paper? Yeah, it's just titled "On Maximal Simplicity," um, and it's it's coming out in Philosophia Christi. I'm guessing probably in a couple of months, late summer. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So so look for the next one. I'm excited for that. Uh, great. Anything? So you're working on this uh, this new Bavink book uh, translation. That's going to be awesome. Uh, if people wanted to hear more from you or read more of your stuff, like where, where should you send them? Uh, well, yeah. So uh, perhaps, uh, my book, God and Knowledge, Herman Bach's Theological Epistemology, that's still out. And, um, we have another work coming. This is co-authored with myself and Corey involved, um, uh, Neo-Calvinism, A Theological Introduction. So it's awesome. basically, you know, an invitation and introduction of Boving and Kuiper's thoughts on particular theological lo loci. So that's coming out. Well, any any idea when when that'll be out? Um, it's already with Lexham Press. So um, <laughs> nice. Lord willing, maybe early next year. Hopefully. Awesome, man. Yeah, that sounds yeah. amazing. I can't wait to get my hands on that one. Well, I hope it'll be helpful to people. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, um, folks, that's going to have to do it. Uh, Lord willing, we can continue this conversation. I'm sure we will. Gray, please come back on, man. It's always a good time when you're here. Uh, but for now, that's going to have to do it. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God.